Hey everyone. Hey, Dr. West is here. How you doing? It's been a week since we've seen each other. Well, actually two weeks because we didn't have study last week. I pray that you are doing well. So you're here with Dr. Annette West at Living Word International Outreach Ministry. And this is Bible study with Dr. West. And we have been talking about spiritual warfare for the last six sessions. So this will make our seventh week sharing on spiritual warfare. I'm just going to wait a minute <clears throat> so that um see if anybody uh, comes in. But if not, it's okay. Um, I'm ready and I'm going to put it out there and I'm sure that um, many of you will come back. I thank God for the many people who have been watching the videos and I've seen upwards of about 200 people um, viewing some of them. So um, we praise God that, you know, he's true to his word. It will not return void. So all we have to do, those of us who are committed servants, is get into the Word, study the Word, ask God to give us direction, share perspective with us, and then put it out there. And He will do the rest. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I come before you as your servant, as your vessel, Lord God, open and willing to share your Word with the world, Lord God. I thank you for this opportunity that I have to uh, study your word, Lord God, and bring it forth. I ask, Lord God, that you would um, give us fresh perspective on tonight, Lord God, as we go forward in this study, Lord God. Give us what you want us. Hey, one, Johnny, Johnny, Bishop Turner, I pray, Lord God, that you will give us what we need, Lord God, so that we can be more powerful as we go forward. So look, everybody, what I want to talk about tonight is, and this is part, basically, uh, week seven of our study on spiritual warfare, but I wanted to look at attacks and count and how we can counter the attacks of the enemy. And when we talk about the word an attack, an attack is an aggressive, a hostile, a forceful, some type of violent action against a person or a place, and it can be with or without a weapon. So think about it, the it is the devil. The it is Satan who is trying to be hostile to us, the people of God. He's trying to bring blame against us. He's trying to criticize us. He's trying to destroy our witness and so many other negative things. Everything the enemy seeks to tries to do in our lives is destructive, it's aggressive, and it is vigorous. I mean, he is unrelenting in his efforts to get us off kilter from the things of God. What he does is he tries to ambush us. But the other word I want us to look at is counterattack. So a counterattack is needed in response to the attack. Bishop Leopoldian Turner, Prime Military, I'm sure you fully understand this. What is our counterattack in the Lord against what the enemy seeks to bring into our lives? God gives us power. God gives us authority. He gives us his word to defend against the attacks of the enemy. And when we are able to stand in God's truth, in God's word, we regain ground that the enemy has tried to take away from us. We regain the needed strength to cut off the enemy, to dissipate the enemy, to destroy the tactics of the enemy, to, to stop his advances. We deny the enemy a place. We take away his purpose of the attack he sought to bring against us. And in our defense, we are then able to stand in the midst of it all and keep our position steadfast in the Lord. Good morning. Hey, John. So look, we've been talking about this for some weeks, but I really wanted to focus on attacks and counterattacks because the adversary has a job to do and he's going to do his job. But are we aligned in the things of God so that we have the power to stand and process through whatever we need to, to counter the attacks of the enemy. So when I'm looking at um, attack, um, 
if you think about it, and we've talked about the enemy for the last six sessions, but have you ever thought about the more, have you ever said this? It seems like the more time I put in getting a strong relationship with the Lord, doing the things that God requires, the enemy comes against me stronger. Have you said that? Well, have you ever thought about that? Maybe you're walking so close to the Lord that the enemy has no choice but to try to attack you every way possible to get your mindset off of the things of God. Have we really thought about this thing? You ever think about it? It seems like the more you do for others, all of a sudden you seem to be lacking. Seems like the more you try to help people, when you need help, seems like there's nobody there to help you. You know, those are just tactics of the enemy to try to draw us away from doing the things that we are required to do in the Lord so that we can go forward. <clears throat> First Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring, roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour, devour. Now, what I like about this scripture, you say, what she likes about this scripture. See, what he said was the word like, L-I-K-E. He isn't a roaring lion, but he acts like he is. And it, when we understand that he is not a roaring lion, that he's only acting like one, then we can focus our things better on the things of God. See, he did not say the devil is a roaring lion. Now, if it was a roar, a true roaring lion, I may be a little more concerned. But he said he's like a roaring lion. That means he can put on a facade to make us think, if we're not careful, that he has more power than he really has. But he said, be sober, be vigilant. You know, when you are vigilant, you are sober, you are being watchful. You are watching for the tactics of the enemy to arise. You know they're going to come. There's no question about it. In our walk with the Lord, the enemy is not going to stop coming against us. But we have to recognize the tactics of the enemy. So think about this. He's always looking for opportunity to step forward and try to pull us away from the things of God. But do we realize that the enemy can't pull us away from the things of God? We've talked about Job consistently because he was a great example of someone who endured a lot of affliction from the enemy, from Satan, that God allowed, but he still did not curse God. He still stayed true to what he believed. And our job is to resist the devil. If we resist the devil, the devil will flee. But in order to resist the devil, we have to be steadfast in that which we believe. If I believe I have the power and the stamina and the endurance that God is going to get me through and keep me through whatever is going on. Then I can resist the devil. Hey Robin, then I can resist the devil. But we have to stay aligned with the word of God. We have to stay steadfast in what we say we believe so that when the enemy rears up his head, whatever type of picture he puts on for us, whatever type of uniform he puts on, whatever type of attire he puts on to try to draw us away, we can say, no devil, you are not a lion. You are like one. You are trying to exemplify something that you're not. You don't have the power that the lion has. You don't have the power that God has. Although you do have some power. But I am attached to he who has all power. And because I am attached to the one with all power, I see 
what the word of God says. I see the power that I have. I see that I am able to stand in the midst of whatever you are trying to do. But what we have to know is Satan has every intention to attack us every opportunity. So that means we have to be careful in our walk that we don't open ourselves up. You know, he doesn't want us to serve the Lord with gladness. He doesn't want us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. He doesn't want us to have our face turned to the things of God. He doesn't want that. And because he knows that that's what we're working towards, his goal is to creep in at every opportunity and to try to get us to shift and to turn in his direction, to get caught up on what he's trying to do instead of staying postured in what God is doing in our walk. But what we have to know is, if we have anything in our walk, hi Karen, if we have anything in our walk that does not align with God, the, the devil sees it. He sees it and he is ready to jump right in there. Um, doing what over there? Oh, let me go on in there and wreak a little havoc. Oh, thought, thought he or she was going there for a half a second. Oh, now I'm going to put their minds on that for a whole day, a whole week. They're not even going to know what happened. They're not even going to know what happened. I didn't swept right on in there. So we have to make sure that we are in alignment. Hmm. And if we're not careful, he'll even make you, try to make you think, hmm. Maybe my walk really isn't the way it needs to be if this is happening to me. He'll make some people think that. Start beginning to think that. Look, people, either you're saved or you're not. Either you know you gave your life to the Lord or you didn't. But now that you have, we still have to walk in accordance to the biblical principles that we say we believe so that we can truly say that we are Christians because Christians are to be examples of Christ-like principles, biblical principles. And look, Satan is trying to grow his army. That's what we have to know. We're in the army of the Lord, but Satan is trying to grow his army. So his job is to prowl. His job is to creep. His job is to try to overpower, try to overtake. He has a job. And he knows that anything that God has for our lives is bigger than when we, where we already are. And he wants to try to keep us from developing and growing in the things of God so that we can turn our face to him. So one of the things we have to do is we have to look at ourselves. We have to assess ourselves to question ourselves often. Why are we going through this? You know, because if we are out of the will of God, how can we call on God the way we need to when Satan is doing his thing? So first we needed to understand what the attack is. Who is the attacker? Satan is the attacker. He, his minions, his demons, they are the attackers. He is the accuser and he sends them to try to attack. Because see, he doesn't have power like God has to be everywhere. So what we have to do, we have to assess. We have to look at and assess what's going on here. You know, and the reason we need to do this is because there are some people that every time something goes wrong, they say, the devil did it. This happened because of the devil. Everything is because of the devil. Now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of things that the adversary is doing. But what we have to know is sometimes bad things do happen to good people. That would be the example of Job in the Bible. And sometimes, unfortunately, good things happen to bad people. Good things happen for bad people. But it doesn't matter. We still got to trust God in the midst of it. And even in Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon talked about it in Ecclesiastes 8 and 14. And he said, there is a vanity which occurs on the earth. 
that there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the works of the righteous. So what he's saying is good and bad can happen to anybody. But think about some of the, the previous videos that we, we've looked at. We must assess our own walk. We must ask ourselves the question, why did I do anything to put me in this situation? This difficulty that I'm going through. You know, the reason my finances are not the way they need to be. Is it because of the devil or is it because I was not a wise steward of what God gave me? You know, everything is not about the devil. Although many things are. A lot of things are about us. So we have to ask ourselves, is this a trial from God? But to ask yourself, you have to look at yourself and say, hmm, what did I do in this situation for this to, to occur? Did I make bad choices? Is this a, I am reaping what I sowed? Or is this a test to see how strong I am? You know, if we ask God for discernment, he will give it to us. He will let us know why this is occurring. He, the, the, the scripture says the Holy Spirit will convict us. So look, we know when we've been convicted because we haven't done something the way God told us to do it. And when something wrong comes along after, we can't be upset saying, devil, the devil is a liar and this isn't happening. Oh yeah, it's happening. And we are the liars. So we have to look at this thing very closely because a lot of times we create situations for ourselves. Your marriage is going through because your spouse was cheating on you. Not that, what, that did, what did the, your husband had a choice or your wife had a choice in that situation. You never have to go down that road. It's always a choice because everything starts right here in the mind. And sin is a process. We process it. We start processing it here. And before we know it, we start lingering in situations and around people that we have no business. And before, and before we correct ourselves... We continue to flow down a path that we know does not align. The whole time being convicted by the Spirit. Don't do this. Don't do this. Till eventually the Spirit doesn't convict any longer. Because we have decided we don't care about what the Holy Spirit says. And we're just going to go and we're just going to do this thing. So we can't get upset with the devil. And say it's the devil's fault. No, it's our fault. But even in the midst of that. We got to get it right with God so that we can be assured that that particular thing was not because the enemy threw it on us. But the enemy can help us and guide us further into it because we already set ourselves up for failure. So where we set and where we, where we align ourselves is very important to our walk. Think about it. We can't counterattack what we don't acknowledge. If it's something wrong in our life and in our walk and we never acknowledge it. We know it's there but we don't acknowledge it. How do you think? How do we think we're going to get in right standing with the Lord? How do we think? Hey Barbara. How do we think that we're going to be in right alignment if we won't get that thing right? And think really about it. Regardless of the reason for the attack. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. Because the attacks are going to come. But we do need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, what did I do wrong to put me in this situation? And if I know that I didn't do anything wrong, Lord, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to teach me, Lord God? What? How are you trying to grow me, Lord God? But whatever it is, I'm still going to stay postured in your word, Lord God. Because I want you to develop me, Lord God, so that I can be more on fire for you. And so then we want to make sure that we understand the count. What can we do to counter attack whatever it is, whatever the attack is that the enemy is trying to put on us? Because if we can't counter attack it, we cannot process forward. 
And see, think about it. When we are under attack, we have choices. We can whine. We can have a pity party. We can sit in the corner and we can cry. We can cover our head and we can say, oh my God, it's just me. Woe is me. People have shut down their ministries that God has moved them forward in because of attacks. People will withdraw and think because I withdraw from this thing, the attack is going to end. But what we need to do is we need to be ready for the offensive attack, which is a counterattack to whatever the, 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 the adversary that the devil is doing. Think about that thing. Since the devil is real, he's going to do his thing, but what are we going to do? What we need to learn how to do is know what the scripture says and declare God's word and his promises over our lives, over every situation that arises. We need to know who we are and assert and let the devil know who we are in Christ Jesus. We have the power because of the atoning work that Jesus paid on the Christ. We have to proclaim as Isaiah 15 and 17, 54 and 17 says, No weapon formed against me shall proper, and every tongue which rises against me in judgment, it shall be condemned. Whatever the devil is trying to do, we have to let the devil know that we're going to stand on God's power, God's word, and God's, God's authority, that the devil shall not overtake us. We shall not walk in accordance to anything that the devil has. But in order for us to be able to counterattack what the enemy is doing, we have to be in the presence of the Lord. We have to have that closeness with the Lord. And how do we get that? We have to increase our time in prayer. We have to increase our time in praise. We have to increase our time in worship. We have to increase our time in getting into the word. We have to increase our time in studying God's word. Isn't that something? And, and think about this. Attacks are going to come and attacks are going to go. Attacks are going to come and attacks are going to go. It may not be the same attack. And sometimes it may be the same attack and the same attack and the same attack. But as um, the Lord told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Mm. Think about this. You have, we have the greatest potential for growth when we are going through a test. When we are under attack, we should become more strengthened and more empowered in the things of God so that we can process through whatever it is in Christ Jesus. But we must be willing to pursue closeness with Jesus. I wanted to talk about Hey, Tuesday, I wanted to talk about a few attacks and counterattacks. Since I'm talking about the enemy attacking us. And, and, and some of these things are so simple. Are so simple. But we still have to know how to counterattack it. So the, the first thing, since I just mentioned Paul, the attack would be a thorn in your flesh. Something in you that, something in you that keeps hindering you, keeps bothering you, keeps trying to slow you down. But every time you call on God, he tells you my grace is sufficient for you. So a thorn in the flesh. So the attack is a thorn in the flesh. And this is an area of weakness that Satan is allowed to consistently focus on so that as a result of the existence of the thorn, the individual has to foster a total dependence on God just like Paul did. Like you can't look to yourself 
to get you to this thing. It has to be God to let you know that his grace will make you, will keep you as you are going through whatever it is. Hmm. 2 Corinthians 12 and 17 says, For because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Think about this thing. Paul said, I realize, I recognize this thorn is to keep me humble so that I do not be conceited as God is moving me, growing me, shaking me in, the, in his things, in the things that uplift the kingdom. You know, God has a plan for each of our lives, but we have to be postured in him and we cannot allow the attacks. To slow us down. That's what Paul was saying. I got this issue. I've asked and sought the Lord on it three times. And the Lord has told me my grace is sufficient for you. Guess what? Whatever your thorn is. Thorn is your thorn Tuesday is lupus. Somebody else's thorn is high blood pressure. No reason for it. I call that my thorn. When my doctor says there's nothing wrong with you, there's no reason for you to have high blood pressure. You are healthy. You exercise. You eat right. You're not overweight. You're doing everything you're supposed to do. You're not, you're, you're doing it right. But it's a thorn. But am I going to let that thorn overtake me? No. I'm going to stay postured in the things of God. So that's the attack. But the counter attack is... I must be willing to build my prayer shield and put firewalls around my life. This means I must decree and I must declare. Mm. I must decree and I must declare that the power of God is able to keep me in the midst of whatever this thorn is in my life. Psalm 89, 21 through 23 says, My hand will sustain him. The wicked will, my hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not get the better of him. The wicked will not oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. Just hold on to God's unchanging hand. You have the power over the enemy because you walk with the Lord. The enemy cannot control you. He cannot get the best of us. We have to know that the Lord is our hiding place. And because we dwell in the secret place of the Most High God, we are protected. Meaning no matter what comes against us, it is not going to kill us. It's not going to destroy us. Because God said, my grace is sufficient for you. So another attack I want to talk about is the attack of unbelief. Unbelief is saying, regardless of what I have been told, regardless of the information that I have been given, I still don't believe it. Think back to the Hebrews. And they were delivered out of Pharaoh's hands. But they died because of their unbelief. They didn't make it into the promised land. Unbelief says God does not really have the power. That's what unbelief. When you have unbelief, you are saying God doesn't really have the power. The God that I claim I serve doesn't really have the power. And if we think about it in Matthew 13 and 58, even Jesus was limited in the miracles that he was able to do because of the unbelief of the people. So just think about when we have unbelief, there is so much that God cannot do in our walk. But if I want to uh, if I want to counterattack unbelief, I must decree and I must declare that I have faith to move from my unbelief. And I would recommend that you go back and read the whole chapter, Hebrews, the 11th chapter, 
where it talks about faith in action and it, it gives examples of many who sojourned in their faith. But I want to emphasize Hebrews 11 and 6 because it says without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Look, if you got a thorn, then you got to trust that God is able to work that out. You got to have faith to believe that God can do exactly what he said he can do. And the next one is unforgiveness. The attack is unforgiveness. And unforgiveness is having or making no allowance, allowance for the shortcomings of others. Holding a grudge against someone who has offended us. Having no compassion. In the um, Genesis. In Genesis 27. 27th chapter there's an account of Esau who had all the excuses in the world to hold a grudge against his brother because Jacob had offended him greatly by taking his father's blessing and Esau said he could not forgive his brother nor would he love his brother and so Esau held unforgiveness for his brother Jacob and the the scripture says um, and Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my brother are at hand. Then I am going to slay my brother Jacob. See, look, when we don't forgive, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, if you really think about it, it's funny in that passage of Scripture because Esau created his own situation. Because he gave his brother, he sold his brother his birthright for a bowl of stew. He was so hungry, he could care less. But now that his brother took the birthright, did he claim he didn't want? Now all of a sudden he's mad, he's upset, and he's angry. It reminds me of somebody talking about, you know, something going on at their job and they can't stand this person because this person always doing this, this, and this, and they can't wait till they're no longer at that job because, you know, that supervisor, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then I, I mentioned this before, and then, um, you know, they ready to go. That's what they've been telling people. And then they lose their job. They get fired. They lose their job. They, they whatever. They don't have a job anymore. Now they mad. I'll never forgive them for firing me. But you said you didn't want to be there. So why are you upset because the job that you claim you didn't want anyway, it just didn't end the way you wanted it to end. Same scenario like Esau. But look, the counterattack of unforgiveness. We must be willing to have a heart of forgiveness. Mm. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Excuse me. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. So why you think you so special that God need to forgive you when you're not willing to forgive somebody else for their shortcomings? Why you think your shortcomings are okay, but somebody else's aren't? Why you think your sin's not as bad as somebody else, so you're not going to forgive them for the things they do? But scripture says, if we want to be forgiven, if we want the Lord to forgive us, if we want to stay in right standing with the Lord for God to be pleased with us, then we must be willing to forgive others. And think about this. We don't ever want to be separated from the love of God. So we must forgive others. The forgiveness is not for them. Really people, it's not. It is for us 
so that we can have, I don't know why my phone keep ringing today. We need to make sure that we don't hold on to things. That we lay those things at the altar. And that we forgive people with a sincere heart. Romans 8, 38. And let me grab my Bible. So I didn't write that one. Romans, Romans 8. Romans 8, 38. But you know, we really have to be mindful of this walk. So that God can be pleased with us. Romans 8. Have you been talking to the Lord? Asking the Lord to, to help you with your unforgiveness? It's so important. But verse 38 says. For I am convinced that neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You want to be in right standing with the Lord. If you are convinced and persuaded that nothing is going to separate you from the love of God, then you must be willing to forgive. You must be willing to forgive. It is imperative for your strength. It is imperative for your walk. It is imperative for all of us to ensure that we are aligned correctly in the things of God. Amen. So maybe, you know how sometimes we say there's a generational curse in our family and we don't know we see it but we don't know exactly what to do about it but you know a generational curse can really destroy a family and I'm sure we've all heard that cliche that says the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and we probably said that on some occasions about some people but you know within certain families there are certain characteristics certain um tendencies certain peculiar peculiarities that are unique to families maybe their family has um every time you look you say man he lies all the time. She, oh, their mama lied all the time. They lie all the time. Oh, yeah, their mama was an alcoholic. Their daddy was an alcoholic, too. And their granddaddy and their great-granddaddy was alcoholics. So there's a spirit of alcoholism in the family. Or there's a spirit of lying in the family. Or there's a, a spirit of having children out of wedlock in the family. You know, these are generational curses. They, they are spirits. And this is a, a, a tactic of the enemy to try to keep the family um, down and, and to destroy um, the family. So, you know, the, the devil's job is to, um, to destroy um, 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 love motives in family and create a lot of negative negativity in families. Um, creating a lot of unnecessary agendas, developing a, a lot of bad habits in families, um, bad temperaments. Oh, she she's angry all the time. She you know she just um, she goes from zero to a thousand and a half a minute. You know, but her mama did that too. Yeah, and her um, actually her brother does it, and the grandmama did it too. So that's just in their family. But if we see it in our family. That means we, we, we recognize it. And if we recognize it, then we should know that it is, attack, is it, an, it is an attack of the enemy. And if it is an attack of the enemy, then we should strive to um, see what the counter attack is um, on generational curses. And so when we're looking at generational curses 
Um, 2 Corinthians 2, 5 and 7, 7, 2. Let me read, say that again. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we must pray that generational curses in our family are broken in the name of Jesus. And we must begin to walk a life of obedience and pray for our family. Be the example for our family to walk a life of obedience in Christ Jesus. Any generational, generational curses on our family can be broken. They don't have to continue. This is a tactic of the enemy to keep families broken. You know, like some people say, um, I used to remember hearing all men cheat. You know, if I believe that all men cheat, then I'm saying there's a that no but no man is can walk in accordance. Hey Randy, that no man can uh, walk in accordance with the things of God. Unfortunately, because people have allowed and said it all the time, I think a lot of men may think it's okay to cheat because society for a long time has said it's normal for men to cheat. But it's not normal for men to cheat, no more than it is normal for women to cheat. It's a choice of our will to cheat on a person. That means we can't be... You, look. If you cheat on somebody, that means you can't be trusted. You know that's what it means, right? That's what it means. We can't be trusted to be out of your sight and do the right things. Who wants somebody that the only time they can trust you is when they see you? I want somebody that I that no matter what they do, Amen, Robin. Generational curses are broken when we identify them, pray about them, and keep them lifted up before the Lord. Amen. Amen. God wants more for us. The question is, do we want more for us? Do we really want more for us? That's really the question. And there are so many. Anything that you see that is not of God, it is an attack. It's contrary. It is, a, it is an attack. It is a demonic force trying to overtake your family. We need to recognize it, call it what it is, and lift those things up before the throne. And when we have opportunity, we need to address those things with the people that we love if God opens up opportunity for it. Because, see, the devil's job is to deceive people. Remember, I said he's not a real lion, but he goes about like a lion. He is a deceiver, and he will dress himself in many ways to entice God's people or people... That are even thinking about coming to the Lord. We have got to pray over our family. We have got to lift up. We, we can't be angry about things. We got to lift these things up before the throne. We have to call it what it is. If it's lying, it's lying. If it's stealing, it's stealing. If it's fornicating, it's fornicating. If it's um, abortion, it's abortion. Whatever it is, we need to call it what it is so that these curses can be broken in our families. We must understand that the devil has a job and his job is to attack. But God has given us the power to stand strong in his word. And for every attack that the enemy would bring forward, there is scripture for us to stand on for a counter attack. But we must be postured in the things of God and walking daily with God. Remember, prayer, no, praise, worship, prayer, and the word. Praise, worship, prayer, and the word. Look, people, if we are doing those things... 
Those things are keeping us before the Lord. Those things are keeping us empowered, strengthened, on fire. So that when the adversary does try to attack, we can say like Paul said. The Lord told me that his grace is sufficient enough for me. The Lord said. He's got it worked out. The Lord said. Well, that's our time because we're trying to stick it 45 minutes. So I just pray that you will go back and look at the video and, and share it with somebody. And um, I thank God that his word is not returning void right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. Amen. Let me say what Robin said. We need to communicate with each other and stop talking about all the negatives to others. In order for us to become whole, we have to address it. Amen. 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 So, Father, help us to only speak life over whatever situations we see. Let us bring them to the altar, Lord God. Let us come together collectively when we can, Lord God, and send up prayers to you, Lord God. Lord, you said that some things are only going to come by fasting and prayer. Let us come together and let us fast and let us pray, Lord God, and lift up these things that we know don't align with you, Lord God. I thank you right now for your word on tonight, Lord God. I thank you that it has been meat to our souls, Lord God. And now we will go back and we will even dig further into it for our own well-being, Lord God. Thank you right now and bless everyone who came into the study on tonight, Lord God. Bless them richly, Lord God, for the time that they expended here. And for those who are coming on to visit, Lord God, I pray that you will bless them richly as they watch this video. In Christ's name, amen. Love you all. Bye-bye.